Sorry, I can't be here today. I have to be at the doctor's, so I'm just going to go ahead and uh, do a screencast for you. So you're going to watch this and do an activity. Let's talk about Earth's atmosphere. So the first thing I want you to know about Earth's atmosphere is it's ridiculously thin. It's not as thick as you probably thought. It's just this very, very excuse me, very, very thin veneer of gas that covers here. There's just a few hundred kilometers thick. Um, compared to the diameter of the world, it's nothing. And yet it's so vital to all life on Earth. And, and so we just want to learn a little bit about how it's composed and how it behaves today. Okay, so just for what it's worth, smaller planets like the moon, like Mercury, they can't have an atmosphere because they just don't have enough gravitational pull to hold the, the uh, atoms down. So you could try to build an atmosphere on the moon, it wouldn't work. But the Earth is able to maintain one because it has enough gravitational pull. And that gravitational pull is going to uh, affect some of the characters and qualities of the atmosphere. Now, the Earth's atmosphere is comprised primarily of uh, nitrogen molecules, N2 molecules. Uh, and that, ca that comprises like 78% of the atmosphere. For the most part, nitrogen is something that most living things can't use. It's a fairly inert gas. We'll learn a little bit about it in our next unit. Uh, but uh, it's pretty much, it's just there, right? But a lot of organisms rely on oxygen as a means of engaging in respiration. And oxygen uh, uh, accounts for about 21% of the atmosphere. That leaves just 1% left over to comprise everything else. Now, the main part of that 1% is the element argon, which is a noble gas. It doesn't really do anything for anything ever. Uh, but a tiny, tiny fraction of this tiny, tiny fraction, so 4% of this fraction is carbon dioxide, CO2. And that's pretty much, you know, be responsible for keeping our planet warm. And it's something that we're changing is making our planet have a problem with global warming. And you can see why that's possible when humans could change the percentage because it's such a small percentage to begin with. And before I go on, I just want to point out the oxygen that you and I breathe in that's so vital to all life on Earth is an O2 molecule, it's known as diatomic oxygen. Now, atmospheric pressure is just the weight of all the overlying uh, atoms. So if you just take a column of air from the ground where you're standing up to the top of the atmosphere, 500 kilometers overhead or so, uh, you just weighed all that, it would weigh uh, about uh, 14 pounds per square inch. Uh, you probably don't do pounds and square inches very well, but we call it one kilopascal. But essentially, it's just the weight of all the air stacked on top of you. That's what makes air pressure. Now, because uh, gases are compressible, and, and so the, the farther down you go, the more pressure there is. That means most of the gas gets compressed down in the lower part of the column. So this is kind of weird to look at. <clears throat> the lowest five kilometers or so is where 50% of all the air is because all the air up here has gotten compressed by the weight of the overlying air. So you can literally walk out of half of the Earth's atmosphere. So before you got to the top of Mount Everest or a lot of other tall mountains, say in the Himalayas or the Andes, you, you can actually get up above where half of the world's air is. Now, and if you go up to, say, an altitude of about 10 kilometers or so, you've gone above about 90% of the of the air on the planet. So, and now what happens is, is you keep getting higher, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner, the pressure gets lower and lower and lower. And eventually, when you get to go about, say, 450, 500 kilometers up, the pressure finally goes to zero, at which point you are in outer space. Now, the Earth is divided into, the Earth's atmosphere, I should say, is divided into five layers. Uh, and this is really just good because it, it, it names them and puts them in order. However, this diagram has a number of problems. One is the atmosphere is nowhere near this thick. Uh, and these are not the correct elevations of the boundaries between them. But let's not worry about that. Let's just talk about the names. So at the very lowest level, we have what's called the troposphere. That's where you and I live. Above that, we have the stratosphere, which is where ozone is produced. Then we have the mesosphere. Then we have the thermosphere and then the exosphere. So let's just look at each of these in turn, starting from the ground, working our way upwards. So the troposphere is where you and I live. It's the lowest layer of the atmosphere. It contains, it says here 75, really, it contains close to 90% of all the air molecules on the planet, but it also contains pretty much all of the moisture on the planet. So, so uh, air is carried upward by convection, but convection can't get much above that. So very, very little of the world's water vapor that evaporates off the oceans ever gets above the troposphere. So it contains most of the water vapor. All of the winds on the planet are found here. Convection only happens within the troposphere. So all winds, all weather are contained within the troposphere. Once you get above the troposphere into the higher levels, the air is completely still. Uh, and another thing about it is the temperature decreases with height. Let's just zero in on that a little bit. 
So, oops, so we're not going to zero in it there. We're going to zero in it here. Sorry about that. So if I start off at the ground level at around, say, the average temperature on the Earth's surface is about 15 degrees. Remember, as we go up, we have that, that adiabatic cooling. The temperature drops about well, 7 degrees per kilometer up. So as I keep going up, it gets colder and colder and colder and drops about 70 degrees. So I get when I get to about an altitude of about 10 kilometers up, I've dropped down to a temperature of about negative 50 or more degrees. And then I've reached the top of the troposphere. And beyond this, air is not going to circulate. There's not going to be any weather. But look what happens. The temperature dropped at a very regular fashion of 7 degrees per kilometer. And then all of a sudden, I, I reach this point called the tropopause. And we're going to see this between all the layers, where this trend in successively lower temperatures with altitude stops, and it pauses for a while. It just stays constant. The I, I go up and altitude, but the temperature doesn't change. And then, look, it starts to get warmer. And when that happens, I've entered the second layer of the atmosphere called the stratosphere. So think of the tropopause as the boundary between this layer, the troposphere, and the next layer up, the stratosphere. Here's the characteristics of the stratosphere that really matter. In the stratosphere, instead of the temperature getting colder with height, they're going to get warmer with height. Now, the stratosphere extends from, let's just say, 10, 10 kilometers up to about 50 kilometers up. And that's you know, not taking into account the, the tropopause or the stratopause. Now, why is it getting warmer? Well, the reason it's getting warmer is because it's absorbing energy from the sun. Specifically, it's absorbing UVB and UVC rays. So by absorbing this in, uh, ultraviolet light, uh, that, that, that energy can't go away. Thank goodness that energy didn't get to the ground because it'd be very harmful to us. But that energy then causes that layer to get warm. So we find in this layer, the stratosphere, it gets warmer with height. Anytime the layer of the atmosphere is getting warmer with height, that tells you it's absorbing light from the sun. Now, it's really important, too, because it's in, in absorbing it, it forms a, a, a chemical called ozone. And ozone is very important in protecting life on Earth from the harmful effects of, of ultraviolet light from the sun. So, uh, again, this is just showing it again. So it's, it, it gets colder, colder, colder. We reach the tropopause. It gets warmer, warmer, warmer. We get the stratopause. Uh, let's just go beyond that and talk a little bit about how ozone forms. And I'll talk more about this in an, another uh, screencast I'm going to have you watch today. So oxygen in the atmosphere usually occurs, as I said before, as O2, diatomic oxygen. But ozone is composed of O3 form of oxygen, which is not as stable as O2. So here's how it forms, okay? You do need to know this. This is something I'm definitely going to expect you to be able to tell me about. So what happens is O2, the most common form of oxygen in the atmosphere, comprises 21% uh, of the atmosphere. When UVC, high energy ultraviolet light, hits it, it has enough energy to break this apart. But then that makes it warm, okay? Now, when it breaks apart, I now have what's called monatomic oxygen. Instead of O2, I just have O. This is very, very reactive. The only thing that's more reactive is fluorine. It's a super reactive substance. So right now what happens is if it touches another oxygen atom, it will bond to it forming O3, which we call ozone. So the way ozone is formed is by high energy ultraviolet light breaking apart O2 and then the separated oxygens coming together with another O2 to form O3. That's how ozone is formed in the stratosphere. And this process absorbs energy so it generates heat. It makes the stratosphere warm. Let's talk about the mesosphere. Meso means middle. Uh, it's really kind of a boring layer. So above the stratopause, now we're in the temperatures have been warming. Now I get the stratopause, that stops happening. Now the temperatures are going to drop. And I mean drop, 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 drop. The coldest part of the atmosphere is the top of the mesosphere. Uh, when I reach the mesopause, the temperatures are about negative 100 degrees Celsius. Apart from that, it's not a very interesting layer of the atmosphere. Why is it cold? Because it's not absorbing any light from the sun. The light from the sun just passes right through it. There's really not much energy. There's no weather. There's no winds. It's pretty boring, to be honest. The only thing you really need to know is it's above the stratosphere, and it's the coldest place on the planet. Now, above it, we have the thermosphere. Now, the thermosphere uh, also, like the stratosphere, gets warm with altitude. And the reason it gets, hence the term thermosphere, it, it, it has the hottest temperatures of the atmosphere. Uh, and the thermosphere, which is also known as the ionosphere, what's happening there is x-rays from the sun and high energy UVC light is stripping electrons off of oxygen molecules and off, also off of nitrogen molecules, but it strips them off, turn them into ions. And because this energy that came in got absorbed, it gets hot. Uh, but anyway, there's a lot of, of, of charged particles up there. Uh, now, uh, the real benefit to us is that these, these very dangerous cancer-causing rays of light that come off the sun and off of other astronomic objects don't make it to the ground, courtesy of the thermosphere. But it's a lot of energy, so it gets hot. Also, too, these 
of these charged particles interact with other charged particles coming in from the sun. Uh, and in the polar regions, we get these beautiful light displays. So these, these auroras we get, the aurora borealis and the aurora australis of the south, they are happening in the thermosphere because that's where all these ions are. Above the thermosphere, we have the exosphere. The exosphere is the outer, the outer sphere of it. And this is basically where our atmosphere bleeds away into outer space. Now, again, uh, it's not as interesting as the other layers. It's, but one thing about it is kind of interesting is that because the particles are so far apart, the odds of them hitting each other is astronomically small, so they don't. So here, the particles, instead of bouncing around like particles in a gas, you probably remember from chemistry, they are simply orbiting the Earth. They're in these ballistic trajectories. And every once in a while, they might touch down, touch another one, and they just go back and skip around and orbit the world and orbit the world. So let's just walk our way through uh, the layers of the, Earth, uh, layers of the atmosphere, starting at the bottom. At the bottom, we have the troposphere. This is where all the winds and weather are. The temperature drops with elevation. We get up to about 10 kilometers to reach the tropopause. The, it stops getting colder, starts getting warmer. We're now in the stratosphere. What do you need to know about the stratosphere? Well, it's where the ozone layer is forming, where O2 is being converted to O3 by absorbing ultraviolet light. And that causes it to get warmer with altitude. It gets up to about zero degrees, not particularly warm, you know, maybe a little over zero degrees. Then it stops getting warmer. We've reached the stratus stratopause. Above the stratopause, we've entered the mesosphere. In the mesosphere, it just gets colder and colder and colder and colder until we get to about almost, almost uh, 90 to 100 kilometers up. At that point, uh, we've reached the coldest temperatures on Earth, which are about negative 100 degrees. Then we reach the mesopause. It's, it doesn't get cold anymore. It stays constant. And then it starts getting warmer. We've entered the thermosphere. It, the thermosphere is warm for the same reason the stratosphere is. It's absorbing energy. But the, the, the energy it's absorbing are x-rays, which carry more energy. And so the temperatures here get quite high, uh, far higher than they do on the surface, up to like the boiling temperature of, of water. They get really hot up there. And then we get to the, the uh, exosphere. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Uh, I don't think I even need to do this. I already talked about the pauses. So thank you for watching this. Uh, I tried to keep it short. Let's see how I did.